All right, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much for coming again, and uh, let's uh, get to it. The talk is, uh, the talk's title has been refined over the couple of weeks, and uh, now I think uh, the time has come to finish experiments with Scala macros. So it's been a while, and uh, when I just uh, joined the PFL in 2011, almost six years ago, we started doing crazy stuff. So more crazy stuff, more crazy stuff, and somehow uh, it got used by people, a lot of people. That was uh, quite an amazing story, very, very enjoyable. But actually, uh, the reality is that now macros are used uh, in production in many companies, and uh, they power, uh, I don't know, uh, software that uh, costs millions of dollars. And uh, this is probably high time to just stop the experiments, stabilize, and uh, provide some assurances to our users. So here I am uh, with, uh, you know, uh, trying to say that sky is not falling, everything's gonna be all right, and let's follow the talk uh, to see what's going on. Uh, first of all, yeah, uh, Vlad said that everyone knows me, that j just in case you don't know me. I'm a former PhD student of Martin Odersky in the lab uh, where Scala got invented. Uh, recently I defended my PhD dissertation and uh, moved here to San Francisco to work at Twitter. Uh, uh, here, I'm uh, leading the semantic tooling effort, so using something called Scala Meta. Uh, we're building useful tools uh, for Scala. A lot of this uh, effort is open source, probably you heard of Scala Meta. And uh, now to something completely unrelated. Uh, I'm also the author and maintainer of the current Scala macro system. And that's what this talk is gonna be about. Well, let's uh, get acquainted a bit more, so, uh, well, uh, what are you looking for? So just some hypothesis uh, on my side. Well, first of all, maybe you watched uh, one of the Martin's keynotes or Adrian's keynotes. Uh, Adrian is the lead of the Scala compiler team at Lightband. And uh, you heard that macros are going away. So you're using macros and you're actually freaking out. What's going on? So if you're in that category, you'll get your answers today. Uh, secondly, maybe, you know, you already heard about new style macros, uh, which we introduced at Scala Days uh, New York and Berlin last year. So they work in IntelliJ, that's amazing. And maybe you would like to know what will happen to them. You will get your answers too, so I see, you know, happy nods in the audience. So I'm probably doing the good job. Also, well, maybe you've already used these cool macro notations and you would like cool def macros. Sure, this talk is for you. More nods, wow, amazing. <laughs> I'm really on fire. So anyway, finally, if uh, you like Scala, you would like to learn more about this language or you're a PL geek, you'll also have fun. Uh, all right, uh, goals of this talk. Well, first of all, um, I would like to explain uh, the rationale between some of the decisions of the Scala language committee behind macros. For instance, why are macros going away if they're doing so well, if everyone's using them? Secondly, uh, this will be a minor part of the talk, unlike some of my previous talks. I will present our latest developments, and uh, well, on a couple of examples, I see how to write macros in yet another new style macro system. And uh, finally, what I think is the main goal here is uh, to show that uh, we know what we are doing, we actually have settled on a concrete course uh, to productize macros. Also non-goals. This is always a hard one, but our time is limited. Well, first of all, I will not be introducing macros or explaining what they're good for, because uh, there have been a bunch of talks, a lot of talks, like dozens of them, and I've just picked one of them. It's uh, my talk from 2014, but, well, it's uh, still relevant. Also Scala Meta. So, some of you who watched the evolution of Scala Macros, they know that it's uh, been linked to this project called Scala Meta, which aims uh, to provide a next generation meta programming API for Scala. So I'm not gonna talk about this as well, just uh, take a look at our website, it provides more information. Uh, finally, over the last year, the last two years, I've been presenting a lot about Scala Meta itself, the part that is not related to macros. Uh, there have been some super exciting developments in that regard. For instance, the semantic DB thing that uh, we've come up with here at Twitter and also worked jointly with the open source community, including Scala Center. But again, our time is limited, so please check out our latest talk with my colleague Stu Hood from Twitter. Uh, we've just uh, 
arrived from Copenhagen, Scala days, where we presented this thing. So hopefully the video will be up soon, and for now there's a link to the slides. I'll, I'll post uh, this slide deck afterwards so you will be able to click this stuff. And finally, Dari is a big new thing. So just recently in Copenhagen, last week, they had the first preview release. That's actually a huge deal because Dari is going to become Scala 3. That's official. And uh, well, everyone's curious what's in there. Unfortunately, this talk is also not about this. And uh, well, here are the two links of the presentations by the members of the Dari team. So I'm, I'm no longer at EPFL. I'm not in the Dari team. So well, don't quote me on that. Just learn from the source. OK, uh, let's begin with uh, our journey. First of all, old style macros. By saying old style, I mean the macro system that's currently in production. It's uh, been an experimental language feature. If I had uh, two hands uh, available, I would say quote unquote uh, on the experimental word. Because uh, even though you have to import scala.language.experimental macros, well, no one really cares. Everyone's using this feature. So de facto, it's a, it's a standard for compiled time meta programming. And it's been available uh, for five years uh, since Scala 2.10, which was released in the beginning of 2012. And uh, it's become, well, almost a mandatory feature that, uh, well, virtually the entire Scala community depends on, starting from uh, such libraries as Scala test, specs, shapeless, and so on and so forth. And the basic idea behind macros, even though I promised not to introduce them, still I need to say something, is uh, you write functions against something that we call a reflection API, uh, which is exposed in the Scala reflect jar, part of the standard distribution of the language. And then uh, the compiler executes these functions at compile time. So basically, in these functions, you get some ASTs, abstract syntax trees that represent your code. And then you can generate more code. You can analyze these ASTs. Lots of exciting stuff. Uh, well, that's uh, pretty cool, but why do we need this? Uh, not many languages have macros. Well, we don't count C macros because that's, that's not that. C macros, they basically do textual substitution as opposed to you know, much more principled AST-based metaprogramming that we do. So not, not a lot of languages, well, template Haskell maybe comes to mind, but it's, it's not a common feature. Why have it in Scala? Well, when I just joined the PFL, I wanted to have fun. But obviously, that's not a good reason. Uh, what, was, uh, uh, what was something that impressed Martin Odersky, the creator of the language, is that macros, they provide more power in a principled way. Uh, so it is possible to do things like code generation, more advanced static, uh, static checks. So Scala's type system is already advanced, but macros really push the envelope. And finally, we can do better DSLs. So all that is covered in the talk that I was uh, referring to before, uh, what are macros good for. But for now, let's just stop at that. So just uh, as a summary, people have found this technology useful. And uh, what's the problem with macros? If they're so great, why do we need to do something else? Well, first of all, here's the bad news, something that uh, I've been conveniently uh, omitting uh, in the beginning of the talk. Actually, current macros, they require you to know about compiler internals. This is bad, actually, <laughs> because uh, when I just joined the PFL, I spent several weeks or several months, actually, just you know, together with people who invented the compiler, who wrote it, just onboarding. Well, that's hard. And essentially, we impose this tax on a lot of compiler writers. Also, well, compiler APIs, they're optimized uh, towards compiler writers, well, towards you know, the full-fledged workflow of compilation. And you don't necessarily need all this power to program well, macros as they are right now in Scala. And as a result, the API is huge, and you basically have to learn it. And uh, finally, our tool support is lagging behind. So still, five years after the introduction of macros, some of them they cannot uh, uh, expand in IntelliJ. Uh, this is pretty crazy if you think about it. So you write a library. It uses cool features of the language. You hit the really you know push the boundaries of expressiveness only to have your users, uh, well, basically get red squigglies in IntelliJ. This is bad. And uh, to elaborate more on IntelliJ, so what, that's obviously a huge problem. Uh, these macros, they require compiler internals. And as a result, IntelliJ is a complete re-implementation of the Scala's type checker. So it's not compatible with Scala C compiler internals. As simple as that, so that's, uh, that's too bad. And also one corollary, I mentioned Dari. Scala 3.0, uh, this uh, new hot thing. It's uh, also a re-implementation of Scala type checker. 
So basically, it doesn't support current macros at all. So, well, two main reasons. First of all, the API is too hard, and secondly, it just doesn't scale to, f to the future. So what do we do about that? Uh, oh yeah, that's uh, something that I already mentioned briefly. So we are gonna continue supporting Scala macros until the last release of Scala 2X, and that's gonna be Scala 215. So actually the future is really close if you think about it. So currently we're on 212, and you know, just a couple of years and bye-bye Scala 2X. And uh, due to the reasons mentioned above, Scala 3.X is not gonna support macros. So we need the solution and we need it fast. So that's, uh, that's why the stabilization effort, so that we end up with something usable way before that is here, so that you guys have time to migrate. Okay, uh, what did we do to make the situation better? Of course, so we recognized it a couple of years ago when Dadi just started and uh, we had some ideas. Well, first of all, uh, me and uh, Dennis Shabalin, my uh, former colleague at EPFL, he's still a PhD student and I've already graduated, we started a project called Scala Meta. So just like uh, Scala Reflect was uh, and is currently powering old style macros, we wanted Scala Meta to be a better meta programming API for new macros. And as early as in 2015, two and, two and a half year, years ago actually by now, in San Francisco and in Amsterdam at Scala Days, we showed a prototype of uh, new macros that were bet, uh, better than the old ones and that were cross-platform. That is potentially supported in Scala C, IntelliJ, and in Dati. In, in, in those times, Dati was a closed source development that was done internally at the lab. Unfortunately, this first attempt, it didn't go well. So this happens uh, in research. Sometimes it just fails. So nothing has come out of, of this attempt, really. Then, a year afterwards, we had something better. So uh, we've uh, rethought some of our APIs, and in New York and in Berlin, we presented new style macro annotations. So that's the cool thing that worked with IntelliJ. And later on, when Dari became public, we actually added support for Dari. So finally, we delivered on our promise for a macro system that works in uh, all platforms, all Scala compiler platforms, and that was pretty awesome. Uh, surprisingly, well, even though that was a technical preview, people have started using it because IntelliJ support. So I should have, uh, you know, foreseen that, but really it ended up being a killer feature. So actually macro notations that work in IntelliJ that you can expand, well, how cool is this? Uh, that, that definitely was fun material for demos and it was very practical. So you can, uh, to learn more, you can go to this uh, website on, well, repo at GitHub and uh, start using this technology right now. It's, uh, well, even though it's a technology preview, people are using it in production. So there's something good about it. Another attempt, uh, it uh, started with the independent research at EPFL. So right at the time when I uh, uh, departed from Lausanne uh, to work here in San Francisco at Twitter, uh, uh, we started a semester project with another PhD student in the Martins lab. His name uh, is uh, Feng Yun. And uh, he did another attempt at a macro system it was inspired by Scala Meta, but it ended up being something quite different. And as a result, uh, Feng Gun, he did an amazing job. So he did some breakthrough research and showed us how to implement def macros based on Scala Meta. So those of you who follow this uh, more or less closely, you know that we've been having trouble with that. And uh, thanks to Feng Gun, we now know the way. And the new prototype is based exactly on this. So this uh, really cool research is uh, available also on GitHub. It uh, only supports Dari, and it's not supposed uh, you know, to scale further, just because it was an experiment, a successful one, but still an experiment. So you could take a look afterwards at uh, well, the cool stuff that Fungun has come up with. And finally, what we're gonna do with all this research? What are the next steps? Uh, well, just uh, the last month, uh, before uh, the Scala Days conference, we figured out that, well, we need uh, to summarize everything and move on. And as a result, uh, based on the uh, Scala Meta API, as it is right now, uh, I've created a prototype that supports uh, both macro notations and def macros. So in the current prototype, we have a compiler plugin that for Scala 2.11 actually can expand these new style macros. 
And uh, we're also partnering with people from uh, EPFL, the Scala Center, and uh, also JetBrains to deliver support for other platforms. So that's, uh, that's something uh, that I created a, a whole new repo for, for this Scala macros slash Scala macros. Currently it's empty with just a couple issues and a big pull request which con uh, contains this prototype that I was mentioning. So uh, before I bore you completely, uh, let me just show some code because that's definitely the most exciting part. Uh, those of you who have been following our developments, uh, you probably won't find anything super surprising. Uh, well, after all, our goal is not to provide something completely groundbreaking, but rather to ensure a smooth migration path. Though definitely if uh, you're relying on compiler internals and your macros just, you know, cast into symbol table or global, or maybe saying c.internal.something, well, uh, it's uh, not going to scale because that's compiler internals. All right, uh, so what we'll be looking at is uh, the macro notation and uh, an implicit materializer. So first, uh, the macro notation thing. Um, here we have uh, a macro that can be applied to objects. And uh, then this, uh, it's like, you know, the app trait at the moment. And then we take apart the contents of the objects, namely we extract the statements and afterwards, we generate a main method using uh, this notation called quasi-quotes. And we put uh, the contents of the object into the main method. So basically, um, unfortunately, I'm pretty limited uh, uh, with the microphone, so I'll have to select text. But maybe, you know, I can look up something uh, for you. Uh, just to show an example of the macro. Oh yeah, very good. Uh, main and then test. And that will come handy a little bit later. Uh, so here, this is something uh, that would have worked, if not the limitation of uh, Scala test. Uh, but anyway, you put this annotation main on an object, and then you can run this main method as seen here. So as I promised, just a replacement for the app trait, which is, by the way, going away in Dari. So speaking of Dari, uh, there's uh, it's significantly different from Scala C from Scala to X. And uh, recently, thanks to the uh, release that, that happened last week, uh, the Daddy team, they actually published uh, some documentation about the features that are changed, for instance, type inference and uh, implicit search and so on and so forth, and the newly added feature. So for instance, I don't know whether you, you know, but in Daddy they actually added enums as a native language feature. That, that sounds really exciting, so please check out the docs. So anyway, moving on from macro notations, which again, as I promised, don't have anything groundbreaking. You just match code using quasi-quotes, and then you emit more code. Uh, let's do implicit materializers. So materializers, uh, they support uh, the type class pattern uh, that in Scala is provided by implicit parameters. So in this example, we have a trait, serialize, which we will call a type class. And uh, then we have some instances of this type class, you know, def int here. So let me scroll up. Def int here and def string here, which uh, truly serialize uh, these guys to JSON. And uh, the cute thing about macros is that uh, they allow you to generate uh, type class instances on the fly. So uh, we can write a macro. And uh, this is tentatively the syntax uh, that we'll be using to define macros, uh, new style macros. And uh, we say that it's an implicit method, which means that it, it will be called every time uh, when there's an imp uh, a lookup for an implicit instance. And uh, then at compile time, it will generate uh, instances for every type that it's called with. So for instance, if you want to serialize some domain object that you're using in your application, you'll be able to do that. So for, for every possible case class, it will be possible to generate some code. And let's see how this happens. So basically for every T uh, that you pass into the macro here, we go through all the vials, and then uh, we filter those vials uh, which uh, are case, meaning that uh, they are in the first parameter list of a case class. So uh, probably if you've written macros before, then you know how hard 
it is actually to write an equivalent of this code in the current macro system. So you'd have to do member uh, member lookup, and then you have to filter, you know, case ac accessors. I won't even explain what that is because, well, compiler internals. And now, as you can see, it's re really neat and very concise. And afterwards, uh, for every field that we obtain this way, uh, we actually create a piece of code that, you know, serializes this field. So in particular, uh, we serialize uh, the name into JSON. And afterwards, we recursively generate a serializer for the type of the field. So basically, when we say predev.implicitly serialize of f.info, we do another implicit lookup for the type class instance for the type of the field. And uh, finally, we emit some padding. So, well, it, it doesn't matter much. As a result, after we create uh, the field generation logic, uh, we are now ready to synthesize the type class instance for this particular type. So as you can see, it's a bit verbose, but uh, this is how we ex uh, encode type classes in Scala. We create an implicit object, and then we implement the interface that expected of it. Afterwards, we just instantiate the string builder. Well, this code is horribly mutable, but hey, that's uh, just a prototype macro. And afterwards, after emitting opening and closing braces, we splice our serialization code with this dot, dot, dollar notation. So basically, even if you are not uh, familiar with macros, you can probably more or less understand uh, what this code does. So it's like string interpolation in a lot of languages, say bash or whatever else or in Scala. So basically here we assemble code snippets, Scala code snippets, inserting things that we generate dynamically. And uh, so, well, uh, this is it. Uh, something, uh, some uh, parts of the demonstration that are worth being mentioned is that uh, there's, an easy, there's a way to inspect types that are passed into macros with, uh, you know, our latest developments. It is also possible to just, uh, you know, enumerate members of those types. And finally, it's still okay to use quasi quotes. So the best parts of the existing macro system, namely quasi quotes and, you know, the uh, well, rich functionality to talk to the compiler, they still remain. And what we trimmed is, uh, you know, exotic use cases that require access to compiler internals. And uh, finally, just uh, let's take a look at what's enabled by, the, uh, by this uh, implicit serialization macro. So we have uh, this method called serialize, which requires that it takes an input of a type that's serializable, and it just, uh, you know, obtains uh, the serializer from uh, the method itself and applies it to the input. It's basically super straightforward. That's because uh, with the type class pattern, uh, well, all the logic is actually in type class instances, not with uh, these particular methods. And finally, we call this method serialize on some domain object, which, which is defined on line 14, well, basically some random case class, which has an int field and a string field. And uh, we ensure that the result is actually what you expect. Oh, so this does work, and uh, that uh, even though it looks simple, that was a big progress for us, because this macro system can scale to Scala, Scala 2, Scala 3, and IntelliJ. So uh, we're working on other implementations oh, to, to make this a reality, to make something that you can play with. OK, uh, back to slides. We've just seen the live demo that was promised on this slide. And uh, let's have a quick Q&A, because probably some of you have questions, and uh, I try to anticipate them. Uh, well, what happens to this prototype, to this pull request? Well, together with uh, folks from Lightband, uh, EPFL, and the Scala Center, we review it. We agree that that's what we want, and then we productize it. By the end of uh, this year, we plan to have uh, more or less stable release, uh, better quality stuff that you can use to migrate your macros. And uh, in the meanwhile, you can also contact us. There will be a link afterwards in order to be a super early adopters. Uh, the team that's currently working on this effort, it's myself. I'm doing the Scala C compiler plugin. So probably this thing is going to be distributed as a compiler plugin, at least for 2.12 and 2.13. Uh, there's Mikhail from uh, JetBrains, who's working with us on the IntelliJ team. And Olaf from the Scala Center, he's agreed uh, to do a DADI implementation. So uh, we're, we're pretty well staffed, and uh, we hope to deliver 
some concrete results quite soon. And also uh, with, uh, you know, we are currently discussing uh, in discussions with compiler maintainers, the Scala 2X team and the Scala uh, 3.0 team about long-term maintenance. So macros are supposed to become a stable feature of the language. So we need, you know, long-term owner of this feature. And uh, well, we're, we're gonna figure this out. Uh, speaking of uh, platforms that we're gonna support, uh, I mentioned before that my compiler plugin is supporting 2.11, but uh, it's uh, actually quite unlikely that 2.11 will be in the final release of well, 2.11 support. Uh, if we take into account, you know, the whole zoo of Scala versions, so currently people are using 2.10, 2.11, 2.12 is the current release, and 2.13 is upcoming, and then 2.14, so that's, that's a lot of stuff. So we just like, uh, like to start with Scala 2.12, which uh, has been around for a year already, almost a year, and then move on from there. Uh, also IntelliJ, uh, just as you've seen on the previous slide, and uh, Scala 3.0, aka Dari. So as I mentioned before, we would really appreciate uh, your involvement with the Scala 2.11 implementation. It shouldn't be so different from Scala 2.12, uh, just because uh, compiler internals in 2.11 and 2.12, in those areas that touch macros, they were more or less unchanged. But again, well, maintaining this thing is quite hard. So we would really appreciate your help. Uh, migration strategy. That's something, uh, if you have macros in production, you're probably interested in that. Uh, well, we're gonna support, at least uh, we want to provide a clear migration path for old style macros that don't use compiler internals, which means that no casts to global or symbol table and um, no usage of APIs which are marked as internal. Also, we want to support uh, those macros, those cool new macro notations that were introduced a year ago from Scala Meta Paradise. And uh, how we're gonna do that, whether they're gonna be, you know, maybe cross compilation shims uh, that you can enable in your projects and cross compile. Or maybe there'll be a Scala fix based uh, rewriting strategy. So Scala fix is a code automated code rewriting tool that's developed at Scala Center. Well, we don't know yet, but we will definitely provide an answer in the coming weeks. So please uh, follow our issue tracker. Also speaking of discussions, so definitely we're looking for feedback because this macro system is intended to be used. It's not something you know in itself. And as a result, if you, if you have a lot of macros or if you have complicated macros, then it says the right time to contact us. So I've created a Gitter channel. Please drop by and I'll try to answer everyone's questions. And uh, that will be the place to chat about the new style macro system. Also Scala Meta. So something the Scala Meta, it actually started uh, several years ago, almost four years ago as a repla well, as the foundation for better ma macro system. But over years we figured that uh, there's a whole new niche for Scala Meta, which is basically dev tools. And uh, since then, such tools as Scala FMT and Scala Fix were created to make use of unique functionality that we provide in Scala Meta that's not available in the current compiler. And as a result, recently, well, in May, we decided to separate these two projects. So Scala Meta is gonna have an API that two authors will be using, and Scala Macros, it, it now leaves, uh, well, this, this part that used to be in Scala Meta, it now lives in the Scala Macros organization. So as you've seen uh, the link here, it says Scala Macros slash Scala Macros. So that's, uh, I think uh, that's gonna be good for both projects because it provides clear focus. So just uh, so that you guys have you know, a clear understanding, so Scala Meta, henceforth, it's uh, for dev tools, and Scala Macros, well, naturally, it's about macros. The APIs that uh, they're gonna be using, they will be the same, but we need to separate them. Um, now, we've come to the conclusion of the talk. So I hope uh, that I've not tired you with the details. I tried to be as concrete as possible without, you know, uh, uh, being, uh, you know, all happy about uh, new experiments. And now uh, let's see uh, what we heard today. Well, first of all, credits. Uh, this project uh, is uh, a joint, uh, well, is a result of a lot of efforts. So. As we see in this uh, credit section in the project README, uh, 
well, a lot of contributors, uh, they made Scala macros possible. And it's really hard to even list those people because it's really more than 50 people who somehow contributed with code, with ideas, with bug fixes. It's, it's amazing the scale of the project. And in my dissertation, I did my best uh, to summarize and categorize contributions from the community. So please check out the dissertation for you know complete list of people. And uh, finally, this concrete project, these macros uh, that I've been uh, presenting today, uh, they've uh, been made possible by efforts from Fengun, someone uh, whom I've mentioned, a Martin's PhD student who developed a prototype with groundbreaking contributions. And uh, also together with Olaf from the Scala Center, we've been working on the previous version of Scala Meta Paradise. And uh, thanks to Olaf, we've exposed and uh, well described the shortcomings of the previous approach. All right, uh, that's it about the credits. Let's get back to the slides. Finally, uh, just to summarize what we've heard today. Well, first of all, I'm uh, really glad to announce that uh, research in Scala Macros is basically over. Uh, we will productize what uh, we currently have because macros, they're really useful as they are right now. And uh, we're very interested in providing a stable foundation for macro users. Finally, uh, you can take a look at our current progress at uh, Scala macros slash Scala macros. That's an open source GitHub project. And uh, please uh, submit your feedback and maybe if you'd like to get involved, uh, come and chat with us on Gitter. And finally, something uh, that uh, this, this message uh, that I would like to get across is that uh, Scala Meta and Scala Macros, they're now two different projects. So even though they use uh, virtually the same API, the, uh, the well, target audiences, they're different. So you use Scala Meta if you want to write dev tools, and uh, you use Scala Macros, well, basically, if you want to write macros. Uh, finally, uh, just uh, before I finish the talk, uh, that's the mandatory we're hiring announcement. So speaking of Scala Meta, this is something that uh, we're doing here at Twitter. So we view Scala Meta as the foundation for better tooling for Scala. And Scala Meta is 100% open source. So thanks uh, to you know, the generous arrangement that we have with Twitter, uh, we can have all this functionality available for everyone. And it's not just you know, empty words. Uh, we're actually working with people from the community, including the Scala Center, for instance and ensuring that they can build tools on top of that. And uh, previously I mentioned uh, my talk together with Stu Hood, my uh, colleague from Twitter. He's over there, by the way. You can stalk him after the talk. And uh, if you check out the slides and the video is coming up soon, uh, you'll be able to learn more about the agenda. And finally, just uh, ping me, contact me if you'd like to join us. We have you know, a lot of exciting developments ahead of us and uh, well, we are really going to make Scala tooling better. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm going to take questions now. <laughs> All right, please go ahead. Um, I'm really happy to hear about the productizing vision. It's a wonderful thing. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to hear about your time frame, too. Do you have a sense of? what your milestones might look like between now and the end of the year? All right, uh, so first of all, thanks for the kind words. Uh, that's exactly the response that I wanted to get. So <laughs> we're on the right track. Yeah. And uh, on to about the milestones question. So what kind of milestones we have. Uh, please uh, check out the issue tracker. So at the moment, it's uh, like you know, super early days of uh, you know, publicity for this project. And uh, less than a week ago, I pushed this uh, to GitHub. So uh, we'll be providing updates in the coming days. And yeah, that's, that's the best, best reference point. If you have you know, any tactical questions, you know, minor ones, uh, feel free to contact either me directly or Gitter. Thank you. OK, any other questions, guys? Sure. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the new markets support the scale as well. However, right now, also you mentioned that it's only scale 11 Okay, that's a good question. So basically, uh, at the moment, as I mentioned, the prototype is for Scala 2.11, the prototype compiler plugin. But we're actually uh, planning to provide long-term support uh, only for 2.12 and onwards. Well, yeah, th that's, uh, that's a bit of confusion, my fault. Actually, the 2.11 thing is a prototype. And uh, 
the implementations that will ship, will, uh, they will start with 2.12. So we needed to have something going, and uh, my default version at the moment, default Scala version on my laptop is Scala 2.11. So I decided, well, let's do it for Scala 2.11. Okay, Jakob, please. Uh, the question of uh, distribution and packaging. So currently we have the Scala Meta Paradise plugin and we have the Scala Macros plugin. Are they different? Yes, they are different. And uh, well, they're going to be incompatible because the APIs, so for instance, up, let me show the source code. So here we see uh, that we import scala.macros.underscore, uh, some package that we haven't seen before. And Scala Meta Paradise, it uses scala meta.underscore. So you will not be able to use this macros, you know, the, the two plugins together, probably. But uh, as I said, we plan to provide a migration path from uh, Scala Meta Paradise macros to the new new macros. All right. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, please. Um, I just looked at, at the uh, Matic tooling PDF um, um, and there's a reference at the back which says that it's integrable with um, six, six five, six, Right, uh, so this is a question about the Scala Meta project, uh, the dev tools part, and uh, the, the question is, so our current semantic tooling effort at Twitter, it's, uh, let me just uh, show the slides. Can Here are the slides in question, and uh, I guess the slide that you referred to talks about height. This one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so our current strategy for semantic tooling here at Twitter is that uh, we're based on uh, two technologies. First, the semantic DB, which has grown from Scala Meta. It indexes uh, Scala programs and remembers semantic information about them. And then we feed this info into something called Kyth. Kyth is an open source project developed at Google, and it powers their semantic tooling effort. Kyth is, a, well, a graph schema for semantic information, plus a company in tools that deal with this schema. And the peculiar fact about Kyth is that, is that indeed it supports several languages, so including you know Python, Go, C++, Java, you know the big languages at Google, and we're also adding support for Scala. So uh, how is this related to Scala macros? You would ask. Well, completely no relation. And uh, this uh, these questions is exactly why I decided to split Scala meta and Scala macros into two parts. So again, Scala meta is for Dev tools, and Scala macros is for writing macros. And Scala Macros, it only supports Scala because, well, the Scala name, uh, the Scala part in the name. Uh, but uh, I would uh, be, be glad, me and Stu, actually, we would be glad to answer uh, your questions if you have more questions about Kyth or, you know, the entire infrastructure that's mentioned in the slides. Okay, anything else, guys? All right, please. We have a bunch of projects that we are in on Scala Macro, so I want to migrate my project to the new one as soon as possible. So, but the local was there was no Dev Macro, but currently you yeah the prototype of Dev Macro. So can I start migrating my project to uh, using the one? All right. Uh, so the question was about Dev Macros. So, yeah. as I mentioned uh, in one of the slides before, it took us quite a while. Uh, to figure out something that works with uh, Dev Macros. So first in 2015, we started trying, we failed. 2016 only supported macro annotations. And finally now in 2017, thanks to Fengun's work, we're on the right track. Uh, when uh, you can start migrating your macros? Well, as I mentioned before, at the moment, the project is empty. So let me just uh, show the GitHub page. So here we go. Just one file. <laughs> Amazing, huh? Uh, but also, it's not a complete fraud. Relax, guys. Uh, <laughs> we have this pull request, uh, which says, new style macro APIs and a prototype implementation. Yeah, I only saw that, so you get uh, no ESSDT Yes, yes, uh, that's, that's correct. Yeah, I mean, that's some, some 
Yeah, uh, so actually what, what we want to do now is uh, to discuss this with people from EPFL and Lightband. And uh, once uh, we agree that on the high level this is what we want, we will merge it and then we will publish in all the instructions how to get started. So please stay tuned, uh, probably join our Gitter channel and uh, as new releases get pushed, as something playable gets published, we will definitely notify you guys. But thanks for the interest. Yeah, go ahead please. If so, if we were to start today on a, on a macro project, given that this is not quite there yet, and like especially if um, we want to maintain 2.11 support, what would be your advice? Like, would it be to start with macro paradise and migrate? All right. Uh, so the question is, uh, if someone were to start, uh, were to write their first macro today, what to use? That's a tough one because, yeah, as you've seen, uh, there were a lot of experiments. I would actually either use Scala Reflect, something that it is there at the moment, if uh, this is something fairly small. If you anticipate this is going to be a huge macro, then probably just wait. Uh, why? Well, as I mentioned before, we have uh, concrete milestones. So by the end of this year, we'll have something that you'll be able to use in production, actually. Uh, it's not be the final release, but uh, it should be solid. So the wait is not that big. And if you need to do something right now, Scala Reflect is pretty OK, actually. So people have been using it to achieve their goals. It's, uh, well, definitely very rough around the edges because you need to know compiler internals and stuff. But you can actually use it to get your job done. So if it's something urgent and small, feel free to use Scala Reflect. Otherwise, just don't bother until, well, several months at least. All right, uh, another question, please. Um, you mentioned that the uh, approach uh, from uh, Gestalt is a bit different from the previous approach, which was the tree conversion and the standard trees and mapping back and forth between those and the host trees. But could you give, but one thing that I, I'm not yet sure about is the actual sort of new core model. Could you give as quick as possible, because I, I expect that it's probably going to be long if you go into detail, sort of a, a very quick overview of sort of the core model difference that, that, that's here? OK. That's a great question. Very technical. Something that, uh, honestly, I've been afraid to bring up because, uh, well, probably just uh, several people in the audience know uh, what's, uh, what this is going to be about. But anyway, uh, yeah, of course, uh, I'll repeat the question right now. So what's the difference between, the, uh, between Scala meta-based macros, which are based on so-called converters, and uh, the new approach that was implemented at APFL called Gestalt. Um, OK, I'll try to be real quick. Anyway, so when we just started with Scala Meta, as I mentioned before, it was uh, a reaction to complexity of compiler internals uh, that are used in the current macros. And uh, well, what we did, we basically designed our own data structures, uh, just to simplify stuff. Because the compiler, it's a, it's a grab bag of functionality. So in some of my earlier talks, well, I'll just uh, you know, show the slides. In some of the earlier talks, I mentioned that uh, there's uh, several dozen uh, data structures uh, that are used uh, in uh, the current Scala Reflect API. And we said, well, what the hell, we're going to unify them. And uh, we're only going to use uh, just one data structure, trees. That was an awesome thing. It was a pipe dream a little bit. But we mostly delivered on that. And uh, the key thing, if you're introducing your own data structures, is that you need to convert between compiler things and our own things. We tried to implement this actually three times. I, oh my god, I cannot believe that I tried to do the same thing three times and failed three times in a row. <laughs> but yeah, uh, every new attempt, it, it looked really good and we had the right people. But Ultimately, what we learned is that compiler data structures, they're just too complex uh, to have bidirectional mappings. So for instance, uh, the Scala compiler it does a lot of desugaring, uh, which is that it, it maps advanced language features like for loops, I don't know, context bounds into low level features that you can then translate to, the, uh, to JVM bytecode. And these kind of transformations, they're really hard to undo. And well, we tried, we failed, so I wouldn't recommend this to a friend. And so uh, that was it for converter-based macros. This is the Scala meta-based approach, Scala meta-paradise in particular. Uh, what uh, Fengun did, uh, he independently reinvented Scala Reflect. So that was pretty amazing. 
Scala Reflect is uh, the old macros. And uh, old macros, they basically expose compiler internals. Uh, there's actually a really neat trick. Uh, no, I, I won't go into that. <laughs> That's horrible. Anyway, so there's a really cool trick uh, when you use a cake pattern and abstract types and extractors. So quite cool. If you're interested, take a look at the pull request that was submitted. Uh, then you're able to provide a thin layer of abstraction over compiler internals. And uh, this is it. Since there are compiler objects underneath, you don't have to write any converters, and you ship the macro system immediately. How cool is this? And so the key insight that Fingun provided is that even though this approach failed in Scala Reflect, we can actually make it better using insights collected uh, in Scala Meta. So uh, thanks to Scala Meta, we have reliable quasi quotes without any compiler hacks. And uh, thanks to Scala Meta, we understood that we need a better semantic API, and we need to expose, you know, less surface of the API. So that Scala Meta showed that it's possible. And now, you know, armed by experience both from Scala Reflect and Scala Meta, as uh, shown in Gestalt, we believe that we're on the right track. So hopefully this is not uh, too much of a convoluted explanation. All right, anything else, guys? All right, uh, no other questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs>